Hello everyone, welcome to Embedded System Designer video blog. My name is Edgars Korsakas and this is the first episode of my video blog. Today I'm going to talk about on and off switches. Why? Because this is my first episode and I'm turning my blog on. So, what is wrong with them? Just use toggle switch and that's it. Well, problem is toggle switches are large and expensive. If you want something that consumer likes, well, consumer likes even surfaces and small buttons. So the only option is electronic switch. Basic requirements for on-off switch are, well, first of all, on-off switch must be low power. Anything below 10 microamps is okay. This gives couple hundred years of operation from single AA battery. What if our device uses more than one battery? Maybe it uses 2, 3 or 4 or maybe 12 or 15 volts. Well, our on-off switch must support wide range of supply voltages. Next thing, our on-off switch have to be high speed. How high? Well, 10 milliseconds is okay, nobody will notice it. And one of the last things, it must use common parts, we don't want our circuit to go obsolete if some fancy component goes out of production. Finally, it must use as few components as possible. Now let's take a look at circuit which I like the most. Here it is, we have two inverters, couple of resistors and capacitor. We have two inverters, one is strong and one is weak. Why this one is weak? Well, it has resistor in series with its output, which limits drive current of this inverter. In steady state, let's say our steady state is a low voltage here, high here and low here. A capacitor, oh sorry, C, C1 is charged to voltage whatever is on this inverter, then user pushes button. This charge appears on the input of this inverter. If capacitor is charged to high level, this makes this inverter to output low level and in turn this inverter outputs high level. This way this loop locks again. Somebody might notice that we have oscillator in here. Here it is. And they are right. This circuit might turn into oscillator if we don't select uh, values of the components carefully. Our one value is determined only by input leakage current of inverter U11. As we know, there are no ideal components, so and this inverter isn't. It has some leakage current and its threshold voltage varies depending on temperature and other environment parameters. R1 can be very high value resistor, but it must not change input level of inverter U11. So, its value is calculated by threshold voltage of our inverter. We are leaving some safety margin. One volt is usually sufficient. And we divide everything by input leakage current of inverter. This gives us rough value for the R1. And we have 26 megaohms. That's really high resistor. If you want to, you can use lower, but this will decrease power efficiency. R2 job is to charge C1 but then button S1 is pressed. R2 and R1 forms resistor divider which might change the input level of U11. We must not allow this to happen. So R2 value is calculated as follows. R2 is equal R1 times 
supply voltage or high level output voltage of uh, U1.2 minus U threshold divided by U threshold. As we said, we leave one volt uh, safety margin from the threshold voltage. So let's say it's 2.6 volts. If our supply is 5 volts, this gives us R2 value roughly equal to R1. This value would be right if we don't load U. 1.2 but the circuit will have to drive something for example a relay or transistor or something like that so its voltage will drop somewhat its output voltage this means U supply or U output U 1.2 will drop slightly so it would be safe to make R2 quite a value of R1 8 mega ohms and finally comes C1 C1 value is determined by propagation delay of U11 and U12 we also have to calculate in rise and fall times of these inverters let's say we use CD 40106 its rise and fall times are equal. So, C1 is equal tau and parallel combination of R1 and R2. In our case, propagation delay plus rise and fall times of two inverters equal roughly 480 nanoseconds. But we have to leave some safety margin, let's say 50%. This gives us rough value of 720 nanoseconds. Then we, uh, then we calculate parallel combination of R1 and R2. We get... 6.1 mega ohm. This gives us C1 value of let's move the paper 118 femtofarads. Incredibly low value. If an input of inverter has higher parasitic capacitance. We must not forget that we also have to debounce S1. So let's size C1 so it would have RC of around 10 milliseconds. So C is equal period divided by resistance 10 milliseconds divided by 6.1 mega ohm gives us value of roughly 1.6 nanofarad. We can round it up to 1 nanofarad, it is more common value, so you probably have it in your junk box. Since 26 mega ohms value is not very common, let's round it up to 20 mega ohms. Okay, our R1 will be 20 mega ohms. Our R2 will be some some round number like 4.7 mega ohms, and our 
C1 or B1 nanofarad. Let's test our circuit. And here we have it, our circuit built on the breadboard. Let's power it up. We have 5 volts power supply. And here is our circuit. As you can see, I connected an LED to indicate state of, its, uh, of the switch. I connected LED right here. I used another inverter and LED. You might notice that I haven't used a serious current limiting resistor. That is because this inverter can output only a few milliamps of current. It won't damage an LED and won't overheat the inverter itself. Now let's see how our circuit operates. In here there is a button and as you can see I can switch it as fast as I can or I can be very slow. Second like just works. Now let's disconnect an LED and measure current drain. Here is our circuit connected to my benchtop multimeter and let's see how much current it drains. Now power supply is disconnected and we have roughly zero. Well, yeah, as you can see. Now let's power it up. Whoa! From where that current drain comes? Oh! Trap for young players! You must connect every unused input of logic circuits to fixed state. I'll connect all my unused inputs to the ground. Here. Now it should be good. Let's test it. Our benchtop multimeter reads roughly zero. And I'm powering up the circuit now. Oops. Well, almost nothing. Way below one microamp. Let's toggle the switch. Current jams around to 300 nanoamps. But that is nothing. It might seem that circuit isn't working, but let's connect our LED and see what happens. Here, as you can see, I press the button many times and that is disconnected. Now let's connect LED. As you can see, LED lit up. Circuit is operating. Now let's see what happens with current consumption. I am pushing the button. and current drops almost to zero. Now I'm pushing it again, LED lit up, and we have 6.9 milliamps. So as you can see circuit is working. And that's basically it. I hope you had fun watching it, and see you next time. Bye!